in the videos asking a question, what is a spirit? I made a reference to the possibility of Christians having demons, and I wanted to address that. And so we're going to do three series, or three videos, where we uh, ask the question, uh, can Christians have demons, and what what is the implication? Um, as always, the book, uh, the public domain book that I have written, Who is the Holy Spirit, is linked to in the description. So, um, one time the Lord led me to uh, a, a podcast sermon on spiritual warfare, and I don't normally listen to those at all, but uh, somehow he did it. And the the one thing that the guy said that struck me was, you know, the the devil doesn't mind us talking about him. What he does mind is that we learn from the conversation and that we stop giving him ground, that we stop allowing him to have place in our lives and in our hearts. Uh, that's what he minds. And so if we just talk on and talk on, and if you've ever been like me, like there have been times whenever I've had just like these kind of like strange fixations with the enemy and spiritual warfare and um, one time I was even several years three or four years ago I was writing I guess kind of like I don't know a book or so I was writing something about the enemy and I was just compelled like I was um, almost obsessed with it I was obsessed with it actually and uh, you know I told myself for a little while well it's you know God is inspiring me but then I, I just realized like isn't God more worried about me, um, or doesn't God desire me to focus on Him and not on the devil all the time? Uh, and it s seemed to me that the things that I was studying were amazing, but um, my mind was just dark in the process, and so I just had to let it go, and I did. Um, so the... The second point that I want to make is that God did not make a mistake in leaving the enemy in this world. Uh, Paul calls him the God of this world, and uh, the devil comes like the thief and the robber. The devil comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Um, there are many verses about the devil... Um, have people being under his snare, him being a tempter and resistor and um, accuser and uh, devourer and uh, just, uh, well, Jesus said actually in John eight forty four he's a murderer from the beginning and so, uh, and no truth in him. And so he, uh, isn't good. There isn't any good in him. Um, but God uses the devil as a tool, just like he uses all of creation as his tool to see his purposes accomplished. Um, sometimes we have a tendency to give the devil um, sort of creative power or sort of... Um, power to um, be, cre well, I guess, just creative on his own. I guess that's, I can't think of what the word is. But um, as, as though he, he comes up with some kind of a, a evil scheme in his lair and then he, you know, imposes it upon the world. And either he catches God off guard somehow or God is up in heaven wringing his hands being like, how did this happen? Um, but that's not at all the picture that the Bible um, says of God or paints of God. And it's also not the picture that um, the Bible paints of the devil. And so you recall in the book of Job um, that 
first of all, it was God who, who brought up Job. Have you noticed my servant Job? To the devil. And then um, he allows the devil a certain latitude to do something. The devil does not argue with him. He takes what he's given, first to strike his possessions, then to strike his body. Um, the first time he's not allowed to strike his body, he doesn't argue. The second time he's not allowed to take his life, but he is allowed to strike his body, again he doesn't argue. The devil has to get permission from the Godhead to do anything, and if he doesn't have the permission, then he can't do it. I'm going to read um, some scripture here in a minute that God God sends devils actually he sends demons um, ultimately God is the authority not not remotely remotely not remotely the devil and so then also um, Luke chapter 22 and Jesus says um, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat so so Jesus is talking to Simon Peter um, and says Satan asked to sift you like wheat, and so the you know, the the question that we would be right to ask is, I mean, if the if the devil has um, power to just do whatever he want, do whatever he wants, wh what does God have to do with any of this? I mean, if the devil can just do whatever he wants, then the, what else is there to say, right? Um, he had to ask God. And God gave him the permission. And then, of course, you'll recall that um, Peter famously denied Christ three times. And then after Jesus' prediction that the rooster would crow, he came to his senses and wept bitterly. Um, what a powerful way that an enemy could uh, influence somebody who was... Um, just so very close to Jesus and was taught by Jesus and in his presence for years. Um, the point is, is that God did not make a mistake by leaving the devil here. The devil is, uh, I like to say the devil is God's handmaiden. He uses the devil to accomplish his purposes for his glory. Um, one time I was under like a, a, a particularly nasty bout of spiritual warfare and I was just crying out to God and praying to him. And I felt like the Lord said um, that the enemy is a catalyst. And so if you know anything about chemical reactions, uh, a catalyst is something that isn't in the reaction per se, but it speeds it along or makes it more efficient. And so what, what is the reaction? What is the possible reaction that we're talking about? Well, we as humanity, we either go towards God or we go away from God. And I mean, if we're going away from God, we're going to the devil because he's the only one who's, who's, who's the God of this world who fills that, if you could say, a void. It's probably a very poor way of putting it. But um, if you think about it, it makes sense. Like the devil is a tempter and he tempts us and he seduces us and he draws us and lures us to doing something that is clearly not of God. And then, of course, um, number one, we do well to recognize that we're actually being tempted. And then number two, we have a choice as rational, volitional, um, and responsible beings. We have a choice to make. Are we going to agree with it? Or are we going to, um, as James says, humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you in James 4.7. Um so God, God did not make a mistake in leaving the devil here. God uses the devil for his plans and purposes. And ultimately, there, I have a song when one of the lyrics in the song is um, forged in fire, not cheaply made, talking about Christians. And so that, isn't that our circumstance through suffering and difficulty and trial and tribulation and persecution? Uh, we, the righteous man uh, faces many trials, right? Um, we... Um, stumble, frankly, we stumble all the time, but God is using the difficulty in order to prepare us to serve with him, serve him and reign with him forever and ever and ever. And that's no trivial thing. 
um, serving in the kingdom of God, the highest kingdom and the greatest kingdom and an everlasting kingdom. We're not talking about trivialities. Um, you know, serving the United States government would be deeply trivial compared to that here today, gone tomorrow, right? Um, so now to the question: Can a can a Christian have a demon? And so I'm just going to answer the question very quickly. Um, and then after I answer the question, then I'm going to spend the rest of this video and then the next two videos just kind of considering the implications of it. And so this is um, Paul writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And, lest, and so the, the context of this verse is that Paul was given a, a wonderful revelation. He went up to the third heaven. He saw things that can't be uttered in words. And he said, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. And his in infirmity is... Um, a messenger of Satan, ultimately. Okay. Um, most gladly, therefore, will I um, rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so very, very clearly and very, very definitively, Paul had a messenger from Satan. And um, ultimately, okay, messenger from Satan, but ultimately the messenger from Satan was from God because God sent this to Paul to accomplish his purpose and to see his will be done. Now, and so this is probably something that's not, um, shall we say, very popular teaching in the American church, but nonetheless, it is something that's absolutely biblical, as we're going to see here very shortly. But God, God sends demons to see his purposes accomplished. He uses all of creation for his glory because it is about him, not about Satan, and it's also not about us. It's not about the good old USA. It's not about what whatever thing you could come up with. Everything is by him, for him, and through him. And that's the Messiah. Everything is about him. It's not about these other things that we get uh, fixated and focused on. Um, and so now I'm going to be reading a sort of a list of scriptures. And this is in one of the footnotes in the book, which again is linked to in the description, who is the Holy Spirit. And so this this verse specifically that I'm going to be, the footnote I'm going to be reading is 1 Samuel 16, 14. And I have multiple instances of that verse throughout the book because I use it for various purposes. But it is, in this case, it's in the green, the green section in the pages 500. Again, the book is in the final draft stage. And so the pages are not 100% certain. And so I'm not going to say exactly what the page is, but you can find the verse, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14 in the footnote. Um, and so I'm just going to read this, that God sent the evil spirit is a picture of his sovereignty. Okay, and so, and so then I, I guess I didn't actually read the verse. Um, so Samuel anoints David. Um, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Okay? And so we have this kind of displacement. God's Holy Spirit leaves Saul, who's the first king of Israel, and he actually sends an evil spirit to take his place. And uh, so God actually used the circumstance of the evil spirit to help bring uh, David, the anointed of the Lord, into the court of Saul so that he could play the harp. And of course, so as David is, you know, God is enthroned in the praises of his people, right? And as David is playing the harp and he's worshiping God and he's inviting his presence, well, the enemy isn't interested in that at all. And so the demon flees, the evil spirit flees as um, David is playing the, the harp, okay? So now let's read a few more verses along these same lines of God sending evil spirits, demons. 
Uh, Judges 9.23, Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. And so you see immediately the fruit of that transaction was treachery. Um, 1 Kings 22, verses 21 through 22, And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, the Lord, he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Uh, and so the sort of the context of this verse is that um, Ahab is contemplating attacking a city, Ramoth Gilead. And the Lord is actually using this battle to kill Ahab, who's one of the most wicked kings in the Bible. And uh, so this, you know, I would argue that we can tell that this is a demon because of the fruit of the spirit. And the fruit of this particular spirit is deceitful speech. He's a, lie, he's a lying, manipulating spirit. And so based upon that, there is a demon. And of course, you know, we see the same kind of thing in, uh, in Job, right? Uh, all of the heavenly host he gathers for the books to be opened, and Satan, who is, you know, if you could say evil incarnate, that he stands before the Lord in his presence. <sighs> right? Um, not claiming that these things are necessarily easy to understand, it's just how it is. Okay? Psalm 78 49, he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He, of course, is the Lord. Um, Isaiah nineteen fourteen. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. Romans eleven eight. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Um, and so I think that's sufficient. Um, the the fact that that even though Satan is called the prince of devils, that God sends evil spirits and he does it for his glory and for his purpose because everything is actually about him is absolutely biblically consistent. And it absolutely probably makes a lot of people uncomfortable. They don't want a theology like that because, you know, what are, what are the implications? You know, who is this God? Unfortunately, the church has a tendency to just say, God is love, God is love. Is that one verse in the Bible? God is love, 100%. But are there 33,000 other verses in the Bible besides that one? And what did they say, right? And so the idea that God is love and there's only one verse in the Bible, it doesn't, it doesn't remotely describe reality. It's just It's part of reality, but it's not the whole reality. And so that's why we need to be a people who are looking for the whole revelation of God and not just a little cherry-picked bits and pieces so now um, we're going to do part two where I uh, hope to show you that sin is demonic. And of course, as we sin, we're giving place to the devil and then consider the implications of all of these things in part three.